Okay, hey everyone, welcome to today's webinar in the 2021 webinar series, Teaching Pre-Calculus and Calculus in the Current Environment. Uh, our presenter is Robert Bob Capetta. This webinar is sponsored by the AMATIC Math Intensive Committee. Uh, any views expressed by the presenter are not necessarily the views of AMATIC, and any commercial products mentioned are not endorsed by AMATIC. I uh, want to thank McGraw-Hill as the sponsor for the 2021 webinar series. Um, if you are not a member of AMATIC and are interested, we would love to have you. Uh, you can find us on at our website at amatic.org. We've also got many uh, Facebook pages for different regions and different um, subgroups within AMATIC. We have other professional development opportunities throughout the year. Next year's conference will be in Toronto 2022. Um, and there are other webinars and traveling workshop opportunities. Um, the recordings of this and other past webinars can be found on the webinars page at our AMATIC website. And with that, I will stop sharing and Bob, I will turn it over to you. All right, well, thanks, Pat, I appreciate it. Uh, I will go ahead and try to share my screen if I can. And I think we're good. So welcome, my name is Bob Capetta. I'll give you a little brief introduction of me. This is my 36th year of teaching mathematics. So I've been at this for a long time. Taught uh, close to 30 years in the state of Illinois, outside Chicago. Retired from College of DuPage in the Western suburbs. And I've been in Florida now for three years. Currently at Florida Southwestern State College here in Fort Myers, Naples area. So I'm also the chair of the Math Intensive Committee of AMATIC. So if you're not involved, please consider joining us. And I'll show something at the end of our discussion in terms of how you can get involved on the MyAmatic page. All right. Well, how are we going to do this today? We're going to talk about teaching calculus currently. And it's been an interesting couple years, no doubt about that. But first, I want to take a look at this notion of proficiency. I look at these as our goals. So this shows up in the impact documents that we have, AMATIC Impact 2018. And this is really our goal. And if you get a chance to look at the impact live on my AMATIC, you'll see what the Math Intensive Committee has been working on. But has this been something we could do during the pandemic? Focus on concepts, focus on procedures, strategic concepts, reasoning, and building a productive disposition. How has that been more difficult? What are some of the challenges we've faced there? That's something I want you to think about. All right. Who is this guy? And why is he there? So if you would please, you can put that in the chat. Who is that guy? And why is he there? Let's see what people are telling me. Anybody give me an answer? Do you know who that guy is? Isaac Newton. All right. Why is he here? Oh, Dimitri, a little younger version of Dimitri. Why did I include a picture of Newton at the start of this lecture? Yes, he is responsible for a lot of what we do in calculus. But is there another reason? Is it more than just Newton and calculus? Why would I have included Newton here? Well, here's the reason. During a pandemic, Newton had to work from home. And my question is, did you, use, did you use your time at home as effectively as Newton used his? What did Newton do during that pandemic? Because it happened in 1665. And you can see what we have to say here. That was his greatest year in many ways. So he went away from his tutors developed calculus, began his study of optics, and was able to see his apple tree. So the pandemic moved him away from formal education, yet he did a lot of creative work. We wish our students would be able to do that too. But it's been a challenge. So what I wanna ask in the chat next is, what have been the greatest challenges that your students in pre-calc and calc have faced 
regarding uh, learning during this pandemic. So if you would please put your comments in chat and I'll take a look at what people have to say. Greatest challenges your students are facing. Mike Caparula says soft skills, learning how to be a student. Johanna says lack of focus, interesting. Communication skills are lacking. Struggling students don't wanna reach out for help. <laughs> Keith says our students see math way. Yeah, we'll talk about that a little bit today. Uh, we'll talk about the fact that uh, students are often looking for shortcuts. Procedures, no one's come up with the first idea that I have. I wanna see if anyone does it. The biggest challenge students are facing. Time, okay. Anybody else? Well, here's my thought. Students' mental health. 71% of students recognized that stress and anxiety had increased, yet only 5% used mental health counseling services. Now, where did some of this stuff come from? Yes, they're concerned about their health and the health of their loved ones, of course. Difficulty concentrating, sleeping, sleeping and eating, social isolation. Now, just imagine being a first year college student, maybe at a university living in a dorm, and all of a sudden you're sent home to live with mom. That's gotta be rough, let alone academic issues, financial trouble, and uh, depressive thoughts. This year for my students has been a challenge. And when I'm gonna reflect back on it this year, this semester, the mental health issue is the first one that comes to mind. I have had one student that had a suicide attempt. I had another student that had a panic attack right before my class. I've had several students crying in my office with personal issues. So no wonder it's pretty difficult to concentrate on mathematics when you're dealing with these sorts of challenges. Thankfully, everyone is improving and I've uh, advised many of them to seek assistance and we have a very good program here at the institution. But let's talk about the concentration difficulties. If people are learning from home and so much of the COVID learning has happened in childhood bedrooms, it's pretty hard to do that with family members and responsibilities, let alone social media, internet, and video games. I had a student in my office this morning working on logarithms. I'm sure many of you have students who struggle with logs. And she was in my office for an hour and I must have heard her phone vibrate 20 times in that hour. And thinking about that, every time that phone vibrated, she did not grab it to look at it, but you know she had to think, oh, I wonder who that is. I wonder who that is. So the idea to have deep concentration when you're always being interrupted, I have to believe is a challenge. Lack of accountability and motivation, okay. Lack of interaction. Students miss their classmates. They miss working together. They miss active learning. And of course, this notion of monotony of life. They get tired of doing everything on the computer. And during that first semester, during spring of 2020, everything stopped around, what was it, around March 17th. And all of us went to 100% online teaching. And it was pretty clear to me that you could not do a typical hour and a half lecture straight through in that environment. You had to find other ways of doing it, that the students lost so much energy in that environment. But Keith, who is here, is working very hard on getting active learning environments working both online and in the classroom. And that's something certainly for us to think about. Another issue is student preparation. So you can take a quick look at this slide. In terms of the COVID slide, the students are losing ground in math compared to reading. Now, again, these are mostly younger students. But there is something about mathematics that when it is disrupted the way it's been disrupted, it's going to be difficult for students to maintain that same progress. Again, two and a half to four and a half months of learning loss compared to only a month or two in reading. This data was just published today in the Chicago Tribune. So I'm a subscriber and I saw that, like I've got to put that uh, in the discussion. 
So there were no state data collected in 2020 due to the pandemic. So 2021 is best compared to 2019. And the data is not very good. 17% fewer students met standards in English, 18% fewer met grade level standards in math, except these numbers are ambitious. These numbers are probably better than they really are. In other words, I expect when all the data comes in, these numbers will grow from 17 and 18% because many districts have not reported their numbers yet. And it's reasonable to think that the districts who have not reported their numbers are more likely to have students who have not been successful. So the early returns are not good, that we are seeing learning loss as expected. Now, how does that affect us teaching pre-calculus? If students haven't met the high school standards, yet they're gonna start with us in college algebra or pre-calculus, that's going to cause some challenges for us. Here's uh, some other numbers to compare. These are third grade students' scores, again, in Illinois, in terms of meeting um, grade level standards. And you can see how they've dropped both in math and in English over that time frame. Here's the numbers from the Illinois SAT. That's what they use. So focus on the math. About 30% have not met stand, excuse me, 30% met standards, 70% did not. But it, this is hard to make sense of unless you can put it in context. So are these numbers worse than they've been? Or are they about the same? What would your guess be? If we go back to 19, 2019, 2018, 2017, do you expect the number of students who meet or exceeds to be more than 30%? Indeed, they were. 37% met or exceed, then 34, then 35. So you can see a, a relatively dramatic decrease from 35% meeting or exceeding down to less than 30% meeting or exceeding standards which you could argue is being college ready, which down in Florida is essentially everybody. So everybody starts in a college level class. How do we manage that? How do we teach these courses if we know that students are not quite as prepared as they may have been in the past? These are questions we have to think about. Similar numbers from the city of Chicago. Again, you can see that uh, looking at SAT math results, 2019, 27% met or exceed state standards down to 21% in 2021. So clearly a dramatic effect of the uh, COVID pandemic over students over that time frame, which I'm assuming is about a year from spring 2020 to spring 2021. All right, next question for you to put in the chat. What have been the greatest challenges that pre-calculus slash calculus instructors have faced uh, regarding learning during the pandemic, regarding teaching and learning, we'll say, during the pandemic. Greatest challenges that pre-calculus and calculus instructors have faced when it comes to learning during the pandemic. Take a look at what it says in the chat. Burnout, okay, we're doing too much work. How to prepare online materials. Getting students to interact, indeed. Getting them actively engaged, Learning technology, thank you, Eric. I will talk about that. Helen also says creating materials and assessments, uh, many, many absences, lack of communication, not being able to monitor what your students are doing. Again, that's a big one. How do you know if your lesson's effective if you can't see what they're doing? Julie Phelps from Orlando was telling me when she teaches her online class, she has seven different computer screens up in front of her. So when she sends the students into the rooms on Zoom, she can monitor them all simultaneously. And I appreciate that, but I recognize most of us can't do that. Joanna says, can't do as much content virtually as face-to-face -face, as well as major burnout and the workload is intense. Okay, yes, 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 and yes. So I think we're on the same page. So let me go ahead and highlight some of the things that I've thought about. Personal mental health struggles. So I'm teaching in Florida that has no vaccine requirements and no mask requirements and I'm immunocompromised and that makes me nervous. Um, personal mental health struggles, yeah, it's, it's tough. It's, it's tough to watch students have difficulty and there's not a whole lot you can do for them. Concerned about uh, people in your family, 
Sure. I think that's real. Talking about the burnout, I would argue that burnout is in essence a form of mental health challenges. But again, as I've mentioned with my students with significant mental health struggles, how do you help those students? So indeed helping them find the assistance they need on our campuses. Adapting instruction for roomies and zoomies. So there are institutions where people are trying to teach both in person and online at the same time. I have not been in that circumstance, uh, although I have been teaching both asynchronous online and in person, but I can't imagine trying to do both and monitor them and do that effectively. As was mentioned in our um, chat list, implementing collaborative learning in this environment has been remarkably difficult. And the students miss it. The students want to collaborate. So in terms of looking for solutions or what we learn from this going forward, I think it's a wonderful opportunity for research, for experimentation, how to effectively get students to work together when they are not physically in the same location. Work-life balance, uh, this has been tough. As we also saw in the chats, the amount of work has been crazy, just crazy. With me, um, my children are grown, finished college. My parents, I'm sad to say, are gone. I have a lot more flexibility in my life now than I would have had 10 years ago. So it's been a little easier for me to find that work-life balance. The reality is I'm doing a whole lot more work, but it's, my life is not out of balance because of that. What I will say though, is my mind is always in problem solving mode. Different issues come up, how do you solve them? And sleep isn't always as good as it should be because with that 5 a.m. wake up, it may be difficult to get back to sleep once your mind starts getting in problem solving mode. Also, the kinds of hobbies that I have done are not quite as available in the pandemic. So I'm sure many of us have had situations with that too. Technology, all right. Yeah, we're gonna talk about technology. Wow, for close to two years, we have been on a massive diet of learning technology. So I will look at some of these things. Now, I'm in my uh, mid fifties <clears throat> and I have never in my life had to learn this much technology this quickly. Uh, younger folks, I think you have an easier time with it. Some of you have been using these platforms before, maybe better able to make adjustments, but wow. Constantly learning new things and the technology is constantly changing. Professional isolation um, is tough, is tough. When you're teaching from home, and you're not around your colleagues, you have no one to complain to, to commiserate, that's rough. Which is why I, I can't thank you enough for being here today. AMATIC is a wonderful group that gives people an opportunity to share ideas and communicate to help us avoid this problem. And I will also mention, at least for our friends, friends in K-12, you often have to manage these toxic political climates you may have seen some of the debates happening at um, school board meetings. And obviously the, the mask, no mask, vaccine, no vaccine, the vaccine issues are very, very difficult for folks to deal with. So when you're trying to come up with a lesson plan, you've, you've got to manage these difficult issues. That makes it a lot rougher. But let's talk about technology, because for me, Wow, that, that's been rough. The amount of time I've spent learning new technology is just crazy. Zoom, I had never used Zoom before March, 2020. Now you can see we're using it today and using it almost every day. Learning management systems. Yes, I've used things like Blackboard and Canvas in the past, but I've had to learn a lot more in terms of the different intricacies you can do. You give students uh, makeup exams. How do you handle the grading system? How do you modify various concepts as you go along? Sometimes schools change their learning management systems and you've got to spend a whole lot of time getting up to speed on the new one. Desmos, TI SmartView, wonderful packages, and then also using them in that um, online environment has been interesting. Well, our friends at the universities are pretty good with LaTeX. Most of us in the two-year colleges don't have as much experience with it, but we've had to get it to use a lot of the technology that we've had, as uh, well as using 
text editing on Word. And I'm a longtime math type user, which unfortunately is no longer functional on Apple Macintosh current operating system. So many of my old files I can no longer use because it's not supported with that operating system. Just one more frustrating thing we've had to deal with. Computer-based whiteboards or document cameras. How are you gonna teach from a distance? Then you've got to record and edit that software. Um, we use Kaltura, which is a way to embed quizzes in your software. And then here's our favorite, right? Photomath, Mathway, Chegg, Wolfram Alpha, et cetera. This, I have to admit, my friends, is causing me some great struggles. As I've mentioned, I've taught calculus, pre-calculus for over 30 years, and I've written wonderful homework sets that I would normally give students a week or two to work on rich problems. And I would give them hints to help them overcome the challenges with those problems. But I can't use them anymore. Because one student will pay someone, whether it's a Chegg or will find it on Photomath, will uh, go ahead and find a solution and it sort of goes around the class. And, and those sorts of instruments are no longer valuable. And I've lost a lot. So in terms of doing rich homework assignments, I, I don't know how well I can do that. And I spent three years at the University of Illinois at Chicago recently where I taught in lecture halls with 120 students. And we would spend all week writing really, really nice questions for, I don't know, 1,000 or 2,000 students. And within the hour of giving them to students, we'd find them posted online. So it's a challenge. So how, how, do we, how do we get around that? So yeah, I've had to learn what these things do, but I've also had to try to learn ways around it, which has been a challenge. Other things, Google Docs and OneDrive, learning how to use that. And uh, down here at our school, Dimitri and I have been using computer-based proctoring software, which presents its own challenges. Um, if you have students who do not have many resources, they may not want to show their housing environment for various reasons. And I did have a situation last year where um, a young man was working at his kitchen table and his mother walked into the frame topless getting soda pop out of the refrigerator. So you could imagine these sorts of proctoring softwares that don't want anybody else in the screen. If you're in a one bedroom apartment, that's pretty hard to make that work. But then you also have to review those things and decide who, who is cheating and who isn't. So that, that's been another piece of technology. It's taken a lot of effort to learn. Well, why do we use proctoring software? Why do we try to avoid questions that can be done on Chegg and Mathway and Wolfram Alpha? Because students are cheating. Less than a year ago, several students at West Point were caught cheating on a calculus exam during the pandemic. So they were at home. So I was unable to find out exactly what they did, whether they shared answers or whether they looked up solutions online or whether they paid a tutor. But I think we can probably all come up with ideas that we think we may have seen in our classes. Here is a question that I gave my online students to do, which I graded yesterday, as a matter of fact. And half of the students had this version of the solution. Half. Now, there's no way they would have chosen to use this model without seeing it from somewhere else. So that certainly makes me wonder um, where they're getting these sorts of things. So what do we see? I'm looking at the um, chat here. Some universities requiring math exams to be proctored in order to be able to transfer credit. At AMATIC, we're having debates about how we should uh, do exams as well. Uh, Libby says they shared answers. Uh, Libby's a person who would know what's happening at West Point. Thank you, Libby, appreciate that. Uh, flipping the classroom, doing rich problems in class like Keith does it. Yes, indeed. Doing rich problems outside of class is getting very, very difficult. Doing it in class, I think, is what we have to do. So, so thanks again.
for those comments. Uh, yeah, Helen mentions enrollments are low, colleges facing financial challenges. So the need is even more so to make sure that we're keeping the students we have. All right, yes. When they copy it, they transcribe it exactly as it appears in the source. At least in college, when you might share a computer program, you would at least change the variables. But uh, that doesn't even happen. So that's not me, but the guy is probably about my age and I'm as exhausted as he is. So just recognizing the challenges we faced with technology and other things, it, it, there's no doubt it's been uh, a couple of years like no other in my career. All right, our next question, if you would please put in the chat, what have you tried to do to improve teaching and learning during the pandemic? So let's see what people have to say. Helen says group exams. That's interesting. Yeah, multiple versions of tests. I'm doing a lot of that. <laughs> Helen says with hard problems. Um, I think I got burned on that a little bit last year with time limits too. I'm concerned about time limits because you have students with uh, learning disabilities. That always makes me a little nervous. Um, I tried to write exams for my online class last year that could not be done on Wolfram Alpha or Mathway. And I tried to ask really nice explained problems like Judy is saying, and the students did not do real well, that their performance wasn't good because they were not used to answering those types of questions. So, uh, but yes, I've tried to do that. Interactive PowerPoints or group activities. Uh, yeah, virtual office hours for sure with weekend times. I did have a situation with my student evaluations last semester, uh, with, which is much work as we've been doing, you know, uh, just crazy, crazy hours. But a student tells me that she works every day from 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. and it's not fair that I'm not available to her when she is. And it's tough. That's rough. That's rough. Uh, Mike talks about reflective essays on the work they're doing. Wonderful. Monitoring tests on Zoom. Um, calling on students by name. Wonderful. Uh, I've actually done some oral exams. If my class has been small enough, I've met the students for half an hour online and asked them questions that way. And uh, I thought uh, that went pretty well. Keith says, let the students work. Yes, indeed. Active learning environments as much as possible. Flipped models where students maybe do other kind of work on their own and then they come to class doing problems. Absolutely. Uh, Eric talks about OER materials, indeed. Shannon, okay, Shannon, God bless you. Option to participate in person, live online, or online. So students can switch participation method from one day to the next. Crazy for me, <laughs> yes, crazy for you, but I appreciate that. Uh, My Open Math again, Taylor, like Eric, is using My Open Math. Wonderful suggestions, thank you very much. Well, I'll tell you some of the things I've done. Or actually, first we'll talk about MAA. So these are recommendations that came out of the MAA. Now, how about this? Distinguish between essential and discretionary course content. But shouldn't we always have been doing that, right? What really is important? And maybe get away from the stuff that is less so. Well, that makes it difficult when you're trying to transfer credits from two-year colleges to universities. I get that, but we at least have to have that conversation. Uh, Focus less on cheating, more on providing options for students to demonstrate learning in other ways. So can you create activities like we saw in some of the chat discussion that demonstrates understanding outside of a test that Mathway could do? And let's talk a little bit about cheating. I, I don't really think it's helpful to be the cheating police. Um, I, I think you lose something in your class if you're constantly looking for um, students who are engaging in that behavior, but you have to do it. MAA also says materials should be made in an asynchronous manner, but recognize students do not want to be recorded and posted online where they might not look their best. So I have not been posting recordings of live lessons, but I know at other schools that's happening, but I, I have some concerns with that issue. And of course, no online harassment. You might have heard about Zoom bombing that happened early on in the pandemic. So you, you've got to make sure that you admit people to the room to make sure that doesn't happen. 
and make sure students treat each other respectfully when they're there. Consider adjustments to policies, yes. And this is a big one. I don't know if it's for us, but certainly for our supervisors, I don't think student evaluation should be used to determine whether or not a faculty member is effective in this environment. How quickly did we have to change things? Again, that spring semester of 2020 and even the fall semester of 2020, there is very little time to get up to speed with that whole process. That was rough. All right, so here's some of my strategies. Number one, encourage sick students to stay home. If you are sick, you might have COVID, you might spread that to your classmates. That is a bad thing. Now, do students always tell you the truth? Might they use this as an excuse? Yes, yes, of course, that could happen. But the, you know, the downside is someone could get extremely ill. So I got rid of all attendance policies. I thought anything that's gonna make a person more likely to attend class if they may have this virus. And I've had, I think a dozen students this year who have been out who have tested positive. So this is, this is serious stuff down here, here in Florida. Here's another one. I allowed students to submit work past deadlines, which is something I have never done before. I felt I had to be fair to everybody. And uh, I just figured students needed to learn to be adults. And I never accepted work past deadlines. I have changed on that here. Will that continue post pandemic? That's something to think about. I also have required students to come to the office to view their graded exams. I did not want exams to get out and post it online in the event I had six students who needed to come back and take the exams later. So I just felt it was best to refrain from returning exams. And I kind of hate doing that, but uh, I, I had to keep them secure. And in light of Chegg and other sorts of, and Kufers and other things, I felt it best to keep the exams as um, locked down as possible. Right. Penalize late work. Uh, yes. Uh, I have not, frankly, been penalizing it much, but you can see different people are doing different things. Some people give an extra week, 10% thing. Right. Other ideas. Now, I have allowed a small number of students to take exams a second time, mainly because if the scores are so low, which we've had in a couple cases, that there'd be very little chance they could complete the course successfully. And I want them to go back and learn those concepts. So I'd have them come and see me. We'd work for an hour or two on Zoom, going over the problems, identifying their mistakes, and then I'd give them a different exam, which again, I have not done in the past. But I think I was able to bring a few more people successfully through the courses doing that. Again, discourage cheating, absolutely. Uh, but I don't think you can become an anti-cheating police officer. Yes, review your videos. Look for obvious cheating. But if someone looks up to the left on the video proctoring thing, I, I don't think you can call them out on cheating. And even that student that I showed you earlier that obviously copied that from somewhere else, yes, I would say be sure not to copy work directly from the internet, but I didn't really accuse that student of cheating. I didn't take points away. I, I don't think for as, as many points as it was worth, it's not going to make a big difference in the grade. I just wanted him to know that I knew what he was doing. And, and very important, you need to strive to be supportive and compassionate. And maintaining your own mental health is tough, yes. No doubt about it. And I've had four different students who have claimed to have flat tires. I've had several students uh, with grandparents who have been ill out of state. I've had several students come up with excuses to miss exams that I think are dubious. Whereas in years past, I might ask for documentation. I have not done that this year. I figure they are dealing with so many mental health issues that the fact that they're at least trying to come up with a reasonable excuse, I guess in some respects is them trying to be respectful to me, but it's tough, that's tough. Focus on the most essential elements of the course. Well, what are we really trying to do? What are our issues? You know, that's a, that's a tough one um, because we wanna make sure that we go ahead and do that. Stacy asks, do I penalize retesting? What I usually do is I usually average the scores so if I have someone that's a 30% on the first test and a 70 on the second, I'll put a 50 in the, in the middle there as well. That's my strategy. Um, let's see, what else do we have here? 
Repeated final, no, no, no final exams taken late. <laughs> Eric says a lot of grandmas die. Yes, they do. Um, build review in the lesson planning. Recognize that fewer students are college ready. Their backgrounds are not gonna be as strong as we want them to be. So as we are designing our courses in pre-calculus and calculus, we've got to figure out where are the areas where they struggle and then review those concepts. Like I said, I had three students in the office various times this morning, all of them asking about logarithms. And in many cases, I had to go back and review the basic rules of exponents. X to the second power times X to the third power. What does it mean? X times X times X times X times X means X to the fifth. Can we generalize that to a rule? Those are the little bits of things we've got to do um, to make sure the students have the foundation to be able to do the kind of mathematics mathematics we're doing. Certainly true in calculus, right? With trigonometry, very few students remember the trig we want them to know. You review the identities when they come up. Make all lessons available online. So what I've done is I have recorded the entire lecture series for my courses and I make them available online. And next semester, I'm actually gonna to check to make sure they're watching them. I'll be embedding them in Kaltura to make sure that happens, maybe ask some questions. And I have the students do that before class. So essentially my in-person class is also an online class. So in the event students are out with COVID or other reasons, they can at least stay up with those lessons. Frequent low stakes assessment. And there's a lot of research that shows that this is an effective strategy. So I've done that even more so. So quizzes at least once a week, if not twice a week on a regular basis. Sometimes I let students work together on those things. And I find that that's also an effective strategy. And I am using a flip model more so than ever before. Um, I still believe that there are times that lecturing is effective, especially in Calc 3 differential equations, Calc 2 linear algebra. I do more lecturing in those classes uh, but in Calc 1, pre-Calc college algebra, it's completely flipped now. So the lectures are delivered with videos and we spend our time in class working problems, hopefully rich problems, uh, but I'm going to strive to follow Keith in that regard. All right, let's take a look at some research on teaching and learning mathematics and science during the pandemic. So what do you think you're going to find? Do you have any predictions on what we've found so far? Uh, Pat likes frequent low stakes, attest, uh, low stakes assessments. Stacy have students put notes on the videos. Indeed, we've seen some of that as well. All right, here we go. The MAA, Math Association of America, did a study of 155 students regarding online math learning in January of 2021. So out of 155 students, 104, had trouble developing connections with their classmates. 101 couldn't find study partners. 99 had trouble getting together for group work. Well, you could imagine if you're at a university and your students are all over the country, you're not gonna physically get together, let alone it's a pandemic, and they probably weren't comfortable yet working on Zoom. And my problem, frankly, for doing math collaboratively on Zoom is you need to have some technology, whether it's a tablet, with a stylus that you can actually do significant math on one screen, it, it's wrong. And you gotta be able to talk to each other as you're doing it. Many felt overwhelmed, exhausted. Social isolation issues as we've talked about before. Many felt it was difficult to ask questions. With the number of emails I've gotten, I'm not sure my students agree with that because it's been a ridiculous number of emails. Difficulty prioritizing responsibilities. Many people had issues with anxiety. Many thought it was more work that the online math class seemed like it was more work than usual. And 51, so that's about a third had no appropriate place to work. Just like the young man who was sitting at his kitchen table trying to do serious math, that, you know, that was not really effective for him. Many had poor internet, again, 45 out of 155. That is a big issue in K-12. Unless you have good technology, the K-12 online learning didn't work. And the online office hours intimidating. My only problem with this finding is 
I think more of them would say in-person office hours are intimidating. I, I personally think that online office hours are an opportunity for students to do what? For students to sort of drop in wherever they are in a, in a friendlier environment. So I, I, I'm, I'm less convinced that that's, a, that that's a really big issue. All right, what else do we have? Okay, they're worried about returning to in-person learning. What are they concerned about? They think the workload is gonna be crazy. 76 of 155. So just about half thought they did not learn enough to move on. So students are saying they don't think they're prepared. 65 thought faculty would require more effort. Concerned about social exhaustion. Many were afraid they forgot to interact with others. Again, isolated that long. 48 were worried about getting to class on time. 48 out of 155. I will say this semester, I have had several students who have been late just about every day. And uh, the first time it happened, I made a little snarky comment to a young lady who got so upset, she grabbed her things, stormed out of the classroom. Uh, she apologized the next day, but then I realized that student mental health is such that it's probably best to leave those snarky comments behind. And now I just say, thank you for coming. I'm glad you're here when they come 20 minutes late every day. All right, there's a blended learning study out of Italy that recognized that the gestures and facial expressions of the teacher were helpful and that these students actually appreciated Blackboard lectures. And they thought that the physical presence of the student was important so the professor can fine tune the lecture. Again, you get feedback from the students in terms of what's working and what, it, what isn't. So they felt that the online class wasn't nearly as effective. And finally, they recognized students really want to work with others. They need that possibility to be there just to stay engaged. So that's a bit concerning. Uh, this is a study out of Indonesia. They thought online pandemic calculus too simply wasn't effective. There were internet issues. Students lacked discipline and motivation and the media was not effective and was not interesting. So are your video lessons interesting? I don't think mine are terribly interesting. Um, I tried to try my best. One mistake I've made is I've made the videos too long. I really believe five to 10 minutes is about how long it should be. In light of the lack of student attention, that's probably our best bet. All right. Next question, throw in the chat, please. What are some of the benefits that may arise from our experiences teaching and learning during this pandemic? Some benefits that may arise. Students are getting better with technology. Uh, indeed. So maybe they'll be, you'll be better prepared for next year. We've had all these videos, you've done all this work that you can use in your in-person classes. So we should be better with technology again. We are more fl flexible. In-depth notes that we can use. So we've been working so hard for the last year and a half that we have resources that can assist us in the future. Keith mentioned he's more flexible now than before. I think many of us have more empathy, more compassion, and we are more understanding. I'd like to hope that our students are too. This is my sincere hope that we can have fewer in-person faculty meetings. Think about those meetings that go on and on and on and on where the same person talks over and over and over and over again. Zoom can be a wonderful thing. It seems to democratize participation in faculty meetings. And I'm in a school that has multiple campuses. So this way, if we can do our meetings digitally, we don't need to travel between the campuses. So that may be the greatest thing about Zoom is we can better use our time for faculty meetings. And let's be honest, maybe we can multitask a little more if we're kind of watching the um, meeting and uh, maybe doing some grading on the side. 
Fewer canceled classes, we don't need substitutes anymore because um, when you go to Amatic, you can have your video assignments, you can have your asynchronous stuff ready to go, or if you want, you might even be able to teach a course live online at that time. So the technology has enabled us to stay engaged with our students even when we do things like go to our national meetings or, um, or such. Again, we mentioned we've learned a lot about technological resources that we can use that'll assist us in the future. I really believe that if we continue doing computer-based tutoring and computer-based office hours, more students will take advantage. They don't have to come to campus. We can do things in the evening. I think that could be a wonderful thing going forward. Again, we have all of these materials that we've made that can certainly help us. Stacy says, totally multitask during meetings. You're my kind of person, Stacy. All right, I want to um, take a quick look at our math intensive committee impact live materials. So I'm gonna see if this will actually load. Is it gonna load? Is it gonna load? Is it gonna load? So we were um, up for November. So I wanna encourage you to visit what we've done. So developing proficiency for students in pre-calculus and above. So uh, Eric, who was on this call, and Mike Caparulo, who's on this call, Linda Blanco and I created the materials for this. So I encourage you to take a look at it. Here is, of course, is our webinar we're talking about today. We have Linda's question and um, impactful thoughts. Impact Plus is some research stuff. Oh, we, I'm sorry, Linda's impact in action with the discussions. And then the impact document is here. So I encourage you to take a look at that. And also the math intensive community at myamatic.org is here. So there's several issues that we'll be dealing with going forward. We are looking at the pre-calculus curriculum and we want to figure out how to better serve our students. There seems to be a general belief that we're doing too much, that the kind of mile wide and inch deep stuff you may have heard before. So we have discussions on my.amatic.org and the math intensive community. So I would strongly encourage you to uh, join us and uh, I will be communicating with the group there. All right. So we'll take a look at the chat. And I will see if there are any other questions. Let's see. Is it possible to put the links in the chat? I have emailed Pat the entire slideshow. Okay. So Pat will make those available. Pat, do you want to explain how that's going to work? Uh, yeah, I'll just um, later this afternoon or this evening, I will send everyone who registered an email that will include the recording of the video along with uh, Bob's PowerPoint uh, with those links in the chat. So you'll have those. Uh, hopefully by the end of the day. Wonderful. Uh, Joanna says her administration is pushing back against having virtual options on meetings, unfortunately. Yeah, I really, that troubles me. And we've had discussions about whether or not you really need to have the cameras on. You know, I, you know, I understand that they wanna make sure people are participating, um, but I don't know. I, I like time to be used effectively and I've been in too many meetings in my career that just go on and on and on and on that are really unnecessary. So I like the idea of multitasking. All right, uh, any questions for me? Things you're not clear on? Things you wanna talk about? Are there any questions that people posted earlier on that may have gotten overlooked with, uh, there's a lot of action in the chat. So is there anything that, um, that you asked earlier, maybe uh, we all missed? Feel, feel free to put that in the chat again or uh, new questions. Um, and, and while you may be typing, let me take this opportunity Oh, she just went off camera. Mary, come back on camera. <laughs> um, for those who are wondering, Mary Menard, um, my term as webinar coordinator will be ending at the end of this month. So Mary will be the uh, new webinar coordinator starting in January. So uh, she's going to do a wonderful job. Just wanted to introduce her to everyone. There's a lot of regulars here, Mary. A lot of, a lot of names uh, you'll get used to. Thanks, Pat. Okay, Bob, we got some questions there. How you. can you teach Calculus 3 in short 10 minute videos? You can't, okay, you know, I agree. As I mentioned, I'm still a lecturer in Calculus 3, Differential Equations, Linear Algebra. I still do an awful lot of lecturing there. So 
Uh, in college algebra, in pre-calculus, I try to keep the videos short. In Calc 1, if they get a little longer, Calc 2, they get a little longer, I, I agree. I think that's gonna have to be part of the deal. Uh, but it's a challenge, maybe one question per video for sure. I wouldn't try to do more than one there. Particular topics people are discussing about removing from pre-calculus, there seems to be a trend to decrease the kind of material we're talking about in polynomials. For example, things like Descartes' rule of signs, boundedness theorem, those kinds of things. I think there seems to be um, a lot of folks that agree with that. Uh, the principle of mathematical induction was only included by one in eight people that responded to my survey. So that's not there. The main focus on the pre-calculus were, were functions, you know, in various forms trig functions, polynomial functions, rational functions, that seems to be the primary focus. Also maybe less interest in conic sections, but again, we're gonna have a, a lot of discussion on that. A lot of discussion on that. Okay, uh, Taylor doesn't like the five to 10 minute rule for videos. I can get my videos to about 30 minutes, that's about it. I agree, that's kind of where I am, uh, but I'm really striving to cut them down. Cause I just don't know, based on my um, YouTube information, the students don't stay with the 30 minutes videos all the way to the end. Uh, Mike says, break it up into multiple videos. Joseph says, remove law of sines and cosines. Uh, okay, now here, here's the issue. Here's the issue. Uh, yes, we will be talking about pre-calculus. We'll have a meeting, I think in February um, to have our next discussion with the Math Intensive Committee. Do we do everything in pre-calc that ever shows up in calculus? You need law of cosines to prove u dot v is magnitude u, magnitude v cos theta. Okay, I like that. I like law of cosines. But are there things in um, pre-calculus maybe that aren't quite as important? Yeah. Are we all gonna agree on what those things are? Absolutely not. That's never gonna happen. But I think we can at least agree maybe we should do fewer topics in general and maybe let different people decide what they need to do. That's kind of where I stand. Stacy says, uh, removing Kramer's rule. Okay, certainly for three by threes, that's a, kind of a silly way to solve problems. But I do think it's kind of cool to do it for two by twos. Fun, quick, but it's, it's a thought. Uh, I have many students that say they don't watch my videos, but will watch numerous videos on YouTube. I think they might be lying to you. If, if you are checking what they're watching uh, using one of your systems, I, I don't know if they're always being honest, uh, but that's something to think about. Because I'm sure your videos are better than most that are on YouTube. I mean, frankly, the, uh, the Khan Academy videos I don't think are very good because they focus purely on procedures and not as much on concepts. Don't we run into trouble when we start losing topics? Yes, we do, but that's a conversation that needs to happen at the state level as well as uh, at the institution level. Right, we don't agree on topics. The list of topics is huge. <laughs> The school I was at previously, I think it had like 150 different things that were included on the college algebra pre-calculus topic list. So yeah, yeah, that's something. I think they may be lying to you. Okay, I'm, I'm quoted for all ages now. All right. Okay, well, if there are no more questions, my friends, thank you so much for joining us this uh, afternoon. I've appreciated your time. We will be convening our math intensive meeting in February. So uh, check myamatic.org. I will also send it out to the same list I sent this out to today. So we'll talk about pre-calculus there. So looking forward to you. Uh, enjoy the holiday with your families, get vaccinated, get boosted, and looking forward to seeing you in Toronto. All right, back to you, Pat. Oh, well done, Bob. Uh, good presentation as always. Thank you for those. Um, words at the end. Uh, yeah, hope we can see everybody in Toronto. So uh, if there's no other questions, uh, everyone have a happy holiday season. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. Good luck with finals. Um, stay safe and enjoy the holidays. So uh, if you haven't already thought, Bob, thank Bob. Thank him again. And uh, everybody have a good weekend. <laughs>